Hey team, Dr. Jack Audi here, and we are continuing our journey into statistical knowledge. In the previous video, I introduced the idea of statistical power and complex versus simple statistical models. Why would you ever choose a simple statistical model if you're not going to explain as much variation? And the answer came down to statistical power, and statistical power is deeply intertwined with degrees of freedom. Now, a lot of statisticians love to chat the term degrees of freedom around. I'm sure if you've ever done a course where they taught you Anovers, they taught you things like N minus 1 and K minus N and K minus M and so on and so forth and all these random formulas from which to, cal to calculate a degree of freedom. But they probably never actually explained what the heck a degree of freedom is and why are we doing these weird subtractions all the time. So let's jump into it. A degree of freedom, here is the simplest way to sort of lay it out, is imagine an Excel spreadsheet. So here we have an Excel spreadsheet. All a degree of freedom is, is a cell which could take on any value. That is what we consider a degree of freedom. So here we have person one, person two, person three, person four, person five, person six. Here is the data. How many cells in this Excel? Excel spreadsheet could take on any value. Another way of saying that is how many persons are there in the experiment? So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So the degrees of freedom in this data is six. That's it. There are six degrees of freedom because there are six cells which could take on six different values. The data is free to vary in six different ways. Um, so just so yeah, a bit of lingo there, I'm calling them cells. I had to double check. That is what you call a square in an Excel spreadsheet. So that is one cell. And so just count up the cells that could vary. That's your degrees of freedom. But here's an interesting thing. Let's apply a statistical model to our data. Now we're going to apply mean. Remember, means are statistical models. They're one of the most simplest statistical models, but they definitely are a statistical model. So now we have a mean over here as a statistical model. So how many cells in our data are now free to vary given we know the mean? Given that we know the mean, how many cells of data could vary. Well, when you think about this, say we didn't know person six value, but we did know the mean, would we know what's under that box? And the answer is yes, because if this isn't this value, 14.1, the mean would be different. So by knowing the mean, we can back calculate what this final square is. We've locked one of the squares in. It's not free to vary. Now, it could be any one of these squares. The key thing is, given any data set, if you know five out of the six data sets and you know the mean, you know that final data value, right? If we, if we have the data 1, 2, 3, we know the mean is 2. If I disappear this one and don't tell you what it is, so we've got 3 and 2, but I tell you that the mean is 2, you know that this last value here must be 1 in order to maintain a mean of 2, right? It's formulaically um, guaranteed the value under that blue box there, given we know the mean. So now the data has one less degree of freedom and we what we can say really is that the statistical model used up a degree of freedom in the data so often we talk about the degrees of freedom in the statistical model which is now one because this mean could take on any value so now this is one degree of freedom over here and only five degrees of freedom in the data because we have applied that statistical model so this is a statistical model We've now applied it. So a way to think about it is how many degrees of freedom in this data? Six. How many degrees of freedom in the statistical model? One. So now the data must go down by one. Essentially, we've stolen a degree of freedom over into the statistical model. Six minus one equals five, which is why there's now one over here and five. So that's what a degree of freedom is. The data loses its ability to vary as you increase the complexity of the model.
So here we go. Now we're going to run a different model. Same data, but now we've got a new column here, treatment, placebo, and drug. So now we're going to run a different statistical model. Instead of a mean of the whole group, we're running a mean of each separate group. So this is the mean of the green squares. This is the mean of the orange squares. So now that we've run a more complicated statistical model, just two means instead of one, it's only slightly more complicated, how many cells are free to vary over here? Well, remember, there was six, but now we steal the degrees of freedom as they go over to the other side into the statistical model. So there's now only four degrees of freedom in the data because there are two degrees of freedom in the statistical model, right? So the statistical model is now the mean of each treatment group. That's more complicated. So now we needed two degrees of freedom because we've got two numbers over here that could take on any value. Now, one of the critical points here, and this is what we're talking about, isn't it worth just having a more complicated statistical model because you reduce the variation, the unexplained variation? Well, the key thing here is this is critical to statistical power. And it all comes down to variation. If the data isn't free to vary, you're not really making a strong prediction about a future sample that could take on any value. What we need to do is make sure that we're making accurate predictions about data that was free to vary. There's no point in making a prediction on data points that can't move, right? And so this is where statistical power comes in, is whether we've made a prediction about data that could vary. So let me give you another example. Let's make this data set even more complicated. So we've got treatment down here now we've also got gender we've got female male and non-binary female male and non-binary hopefully there were more options than that but just in this study we had two uh, persons who identified as non-binary so now let's take the mean of the treatment and gender group. So we can, we're only taking the mean of each unique combination. So the placebo female, she gets her own mean. Placebo male, he gets his own mean. Placebo non-binary, they get their own mean. So each group member gets their own mean. Now what we can see is we've now got six cells that could all theoretically vary over on this side of the statistical model, and we've got our data. So now the degrees of freedom of the data is zero, and the degrees of freedom of the model is six. We've put all of our degrees of freedom into the model. So now the data over here Given these means, given this statistical model, this data is not free to vary at all, right? So how likely is it that these means are going to be accurate when we take a new sample? Remember, science is all about making predictions, particularly predictions of new samples. So if we were to run this experiment again, would we likely get these exact values? No, our predictions are now worthless because we've predicted data that wasn't free to vary. So statistical power leans heavily on the data being free to vary, right? Because if your model explains a lot of variation and the data was free to vary, that is a good model. If your model explains a lot of variation, but the data was not free to vary, then you have explained nothing, right? You've, you won't be able to make a prediction at all about the future because essentially the model just modeled the data that wasn't free to vary. It wasn't a degree of freedom. So this value is very important when it comes to statistical power. If it's zero, you have zero statistical power in this test here. So um, we can see that model complexity could improve fit, but it will decrease statistical power because there are no degrees of freedom. So in this model here, it's a very simple model. Um, so we haven't used up a lot of degrees of freedom. In this model here, it's an incredibly complicated model. So we've used up actually all the degrees of freedom of the data. And so it's not a powerful test. So even though it's explained lots of variation, it's not powerful because it hasn't explained data that was free to vary. But here's an interesting question. This is a nice simple model, but how many degrees of freedom are used up in this statistical model? So we saw in the t-test, you've got two means, so that's two degrees of freedom. What's going on here with a linear regression? So each one of these points here, let's do that again because James Cameron will be proud of that animation. Each one of these, these points could be anywhere in the space here, right? So we have 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine degrees of freedom in our data because each of those uh, data points could be in a different location. Okay, so each point could be in a different location. So it would actually take a pair of Excel um, cells to make up a data point, um, but you could say that each one of these is a person. So this data point can only vary in this two dimensional space. So it is one degree of freedom for each data point. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Each data point, is, let's go through that animation again. Each data point is free to vary in this space, and we have nine of them. So how many are used up by the statistical model? Well, think back. Think back to when you were 14, probably 13, and you were in mathematics, and they were teaching you the formula for a line, and you were thinking, I'm never going to use this in my life. And here we go. We're going to use it. Y equals MX plus C. Who remembers that? So Y, in this case, is coolness. Um, oh, yeah, I forgot to talk about this. This data is coolness modeled by knowledge of immunology. So clearly, the more you know about immunology, the cooler you are. I'm sure this is real data. Um, don't try and repeat it, though. So uh, Y equals MX plus C. Y is coolness. Um, X is knowledge of immunology. M is the gradient of the line here, so the slope. Of the line and the c is a constant that's why it's c um it's a constant but another way to think about it is it's the y intercept right it's a constant so if you shift up and down the line that's c if you tilt the line that's m right so there's two values there so we can see hey there's two values in our excel spreadsheet needed to describe a line m and c so those two values are the statistical model and they are the ones using up our data set so if you think about that excel spreadsheet you only need two numbers here to describe the statistical model to describe the relationship between these two variables um, and so these two values are eating up our degrees of freedom so there's nine in the data minus two equals seven left over two have gone into the model now annoyingly statisticians have decided to flip the formula um, and it's actually for a very smart reason so um, we don't use c and m we use beta zero and beta one and we flip it we start with the constant so that's your c right there down there and this is your gradient right there it's the exact same formula it's just flipped so it's y equals constant plus gradient times x but the constant is called m uh, beta zero and the gradient is called beta one and that's because you could actually have lots of vari variable with each with their own value now we call these coefficients now don't worry about learning that but in statistics um, we call these values coefficients and each new variable gets a coefficient so say we wanted to predict coolness by knowledge of immunology and maybe knowledge of statistics right that would be another variable so it would be plus beta 2 z and z being knowledge of statistics and we might have another variable plus beta 3 and that is uh being a new zealander or not right so you can just add more and more and so often you know say you want to map lung cancer risk you might look at smoking obesity alcohol intake if you're trying to model lung cancer risk you would want to take multiple variables into account so that's why statisticians flip the formula because you want to constantly add new variables onto the end there it does kind of make sense so here's a new model here. Now this is a curvy model that's actually closer to all the dots. How many degrees of freedom are used up in this statistical model? Well, this is actually a polynomial model. So it's using a complicated mathematical formula, again, that you never thought you'd need. Um, and so here we can see that we need a coefficient for every um, part of this mathematical formula. And so now we're using up lots more of degrees of freedom to describe this uh, model here, right? So the more complex the statistical model that we overlay, the more coefficients that we need. So the more cells in the Excel spreadsheet that we need to describe our model. So therefore we are using up degrees of freedom. The data is now less free to vary because we are using using it up in our statistical model. So the data now goes from, now there's only five degrees of freedom left in the model, so that means our power is really dropping because we've used up four degrees of freedom in our statistical model. And this is what it would look like in a statistical expression. You can see it's flipped, so we've got beta zero, C, beta one, 
is B, beta 2 is A, and beta 3 is M. And you can see the benefit here. Rather, if you just number them, all beta 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, you don't need to come up with new letters M, A, B, C. It's clunky, right? So statisticians are quite smart in using this um, lexicon, this, this uh, way of writing out their formulas. Now, you can see in this model here, we've got less variation. The points are on average closer to the line compared to this model. It's much larger. But so model in, increasing model complexity always improves the fit, but it decreases the statistical power. And we can actually do tests to evaluate whether it was worth it. In general, a simple model is normally better. So obviously i don't want you to know the mathematical relationships there it's hugely numerical and statistical and uh full of algorithms and all this kind of stuff um and you won't learn it you won't memorize that even statisticians forget it and they just start using the software um, and typing in the code so they don't actually do these calculations but what's critical What's critical, and I hope you get from these videos, is that when we talk about stats, don't talk about t-tests and ANOVAs. Talk about statistical models. Talk about the statistical model explaining variation, and there's some unexplained variation left over. The more variation it explains, the better. Um, and so does this variable explain a significant amount of variation, right? For example, does smoking explain a significant amount of variation in your lung cancer risk? And of course it does, right? So um uh, it's all about explained versus unexplained variation. Don't talk about TTS because it's all just statistical models. Another critical point there is degrees of freedom. If we build complex statistical models, our data isn't free to vary. So we didn't actually predict anything of worth and our model is not robust. If you were to take another sample, the model probably wouldn't work on that next sample because we didn't allow the data to vary. We just modeled all the data points there. And so there was nothing there, no, no variation that was explained by our model because the data wasn't free to vary in the first place right so degrees of freedom are critically critical to retain in your statistical model and that's all intrinsically linked to this concept of statistical power right statistical power says if your model can predict a huge amount of variation and the data was free to vary and there was lots of data right you collected huge amounts of data and your model really accurately predicted that data you know it's got a lot of statistical power right it's worth it it's it's repeatable it was worth doing and you have a high confidence in it that all comes down to statistical power so it's critical that you understand those three points to really get statistics now up next i'm gonna dive a bit deeper into that idea that everything is a linear model i've been saying it over and over again but i've never really proved it to you so i'm going to try provide some substantial evidence for the fact that t-tests ANOVAs and COVAs, linear regressions, multiple regressions, they're all just linear models. So I'm going to jump into that now. 